thanks. I am not going to introduce myself because I find that incredibly awkward. So just safe to say I am Lisa Forday. I have shown my identification at the door so people know I am who I say I am. Unlike Holly, who came for me, who, you know, you may not want to trust on, on the Facebook. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm here to talk today about um, how not to handle a ransomware attack. And when I was preparing for this talk, I came across this quote. And the quote actually comes from a saying that a lot of people on Wall Street started to use. And it's often wrong, never in doubt. And it depicts a situation where, in this case, traders would um, essentially make trades that they were super confident were going to make loads of money based purely off of intuition. And it didn't work out. And I thought it's really striking because in the work I do, when I'm helping companies prepare for a cyber attack, a lot of the decision making that I see very much fits into this category, often wrong, never in doubt. They're not using data. They're not often using advice. They're not working through the playbooks that the CISO and the uh, security team have written. Um, they're not even really following best practice. And often I've seen gold teams, so CEOs, CFOs, uh, so C-suite executives making decisions that they claim is based off of their intuition. And often it goes really, really wrong. It's become a sort of, I would say like a, a pillar almost of how companies handle cyber incidents. And it doesn't tend to end well. And probably as I'm saying this, brand names are flashing through your minds of companies that maybe haven't handled an incident particularly well. And there's loads of examples of that. Um, and we're going to come on to some of the things later on. So often wrong, never in doubt. That is the, the slogan for most companies' incident response. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to focus mainly on the sort of double extortion ransomware attacks. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, what this is, is a, a sort of evolved tactic, I suppose, from attackers where they sort of execute a traditional ransomware attack. But prior to doing that, they'll also exfiltrate usually a really large quantity of data from a couple of months of doing so um, and hold that essentially as, a, as an extortion tactic against the company. Um, they've become very, very good at doing that. I've also seen them quite um, cleverly, I suppose, um, approaching the main customers of that company and saying, this is the data we have. You need to call the company and tell them to pay the ransom, which works really well as a, as a sort of leverage tactic. Um, but I also appreciate that it's not all going to be serious in this talk. So what I've done is I've put quotes from the main ransomware groups on lovely motivational images. Um, <laughs> So hopefully some of them will see that and they'll, everyone will find it funny. Um, so the three kind of big mistakes that I'm going to talk about today. The first one is uh, they're all sort of the, uh, I suppose, the default position of a lot of companies. Keep it quiet. No one will know. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, never pay. You can't trust them. Or the belief that actually it's really simple to pay, which is also not the case. And then my personal bugbear of uh, C-suite or gold teams, which is it won't take long to recover, just chill. Um, and in their minds, I truly believe they think there is this button that exists within the IT team. And you just press that button and you restore from backup and go back to where you were. And then that's it. And that's their decision making done and everything's cool. Um, Unfortunately, we realize that that's not the case, but we'll get into that in a bit more detail. So start with this wonderful quote. The, this came from um, the ransomware group R Evil, who allegedly are named so named because the founders really liked playing Resident Evil. So uh, that's where the ransomware group came from. And they were talking in this particular situation, they were actually talking to a journalist. Um, and they were talking about the fact that this was really difficult for people to break into the ransomware market because it's so saturated um, and it's so highly skilled that there's very few gaps in the market. So I guess they have a, an opposite problem to us with the skills gap. I don't know. <laughs> Good for them. Um, so the first one that I really want to talk about is keep it quiet. Nobody will know. Um, and I can't stress this enough. The number of times 
I've run exercises or worked with C-suites of big companies and the general counsel has said to me, well, we don't need to notify the ICO. The time hasn't started running. And I was like, okay, okay, fine. Why do you say that? Well, we don't know we've had a data breach. We suspect we've had a data breach and we suspect, but suspect is not knowing. We haven't got to the point where we 100% know yet. So we don't need to start the clock running. Okay. The CEO looks over and he says, yeah, I think that's a good policy. We just won't, we won't tell anybody yet. We don't know. Splash screens are on your (laughs) devices around your company. (laughs) It could still be an IT outage. Okay. Okay. There's a really big problem with this strategy. And that is that as soon as someone knows, (coughs) Dan Card, (laughs) don't tell him I said that. Um, (laughs) As soon as someone knows, It'll be on Twitter. It'll be all over the press. Staff will be talking about it. Rumors will be spreading. And what will happen is the actual narrative, the actual thing that has happened, will not be communicated properly at all. And what will be communicated instead is a nonsense that then you have to be on the firefighting arm of, and your comms team will now have an absolute nightmare getting ahead of that story. So keep it quiet, no one will know, is is not a good strategy. Um... The other thing that um, I want to point out about this is that there are actually a lot of people that have to be told when you have a breach. And again, this often is where I sort of come up against general counsels in these companies that I work with who have a different perspective on this, um, I suppose. People like the insurers, your regulators, the board, all of these people need to be communicated with, customers, the public. Um, And the companies that do this really, really well, and they are few and far between, but the companies that do this really well have comms plans where the comms team has worked with the cyber team. They've identified the stakeholders that need to be notified. They've ranked them from high priority, high frequency, low priority, low frequency in terms of the comms they receive. And it works really, really well. One example, actually, I'll come on to that in a second, Um, The other thing I say is, if you tell one person, you tell everyone. It is not the case that you can tell your regulator and expect no one else will find out. Um, I'm going to have to say this. I might get shot by people in the audience. That's fine. Um, Capita. (laughs) Okay. So, Capita had to... um, had an IT outage. Um, and the IT outage looked pretty serious. And I think a lot of people probably in this room were looking at it going, mm, looks like quite, a, quite an IT outage. Um, it then transpired that they'd actually been in touch with the ICO, which again, for an IT outage, seems like you're being a bit overly cautious. I wouldn't contact the ICO for an IT outage, but okay, okay, fine. Um, they then kept reassuring all their customers. Some of my clients are their customers. They kept reassuring them that there was nothing, there was no attack, nothing was going wrong. But they had to notify the London Stock Exchange. And on Monday morning, the London Stock Exchange posted a notice on their website that was written by Capita that said, we have experienced a cyber attack. At this point, nobody of their customers had been told it was a cyber attack. <laughs> So Google Alerts goes off and you read this London Stock Exchange announcement and the people at Capita also didn't know this had been public and people were knowing about it. So they were still going down the line of it's an IT outage, it's an IT outage. And very quickly, the you saw the media shift from their usual kind of lack of empathy to actually being quite combative on how they'd handled it. And what you saw was quite interesting because because they'd done this and because it now looked deceitful, everything else they put out from that point onwards was not treated as gospel. It was treated as this is potentially a load of rubbish. Um, so that was a big mistake from their perspective. Um, and I guess that comes back to being transparent, but not oversharing. <laughs> this is what I always tell people that If you don't know you've had a cyber attack, you don't need to tell people you've had a cyber attack. That's fine. If you're still investigating, you're investigating. No one's going to hold that against you. But the moment you know that all the data is gone, it starts to become a little bit 
unfeasible to maintain that position. The final point on keeping quiet, and actually this was done pretty well. Unfortunately, I was not in this breach. Ferrari um, had a ransomware attack and they lost a load of data. Um, it's the only breach I really wish I'd actually been in, but uh, alas. Um, and they did some really awesome comms and they've got these still up on their website. So go check it out if you are looking to improve your crisis management in your organizations. And Ferrari did a really masterful thing. And they partially did this because they've had quite a lot of breaches. Um, but they put out a statement that was written in the first person and signed off by the CEO. And the whole thing read like it had come from the CEO. It wasn't company like we had this and we are investigating and we are taking this seriously. It was, I am looking into this. I am taking this seriously. I am working with these people. I am making sure this happens. And the touch was really, really nice. And they, they did some really masterful comms. So if you want some templates of how to do stuff, that's, that's definitely a good one to look for. But on to our next quote. <laughs> no matter how bad you think our work is, we are pleased to know that we have changed someone's life. <laughs> <laughs> so this came from dark side and this was referencing their strategy that they came up with where they gave a percentage of the ransom paid to charity <laughs> yeah nice don't think we need to say anything more about that but there you go so that brings me on to my next point about payment so i'm not going to go into the morality of whether or not we should pay a ransom and you know, what are we funding? Are we not funding? Blah, blah, blah. We've all seen those discussions. Um, but the fact of the matter is people do pay. A lot of people do pay. And you could very well be backed into a corner where that is your only option to get out. That happens. That's a realistic situation that you could find yourself in. And so in preparing for these sorts of things, one thing that I think is really prudent is to have the discussions at board level, at C-suite level, about if we were to pay a ransom, when would that happen? At what level? What would, what sort of limit? What kind of policy might we have? Definitely don't write this down and store it on your network. <laughs> don't do that. Um, but it is a good discussion to have and something that I think can save a lot of time. And it's amazing when you start getting into it, how complicated that can get. One thing that I often realize is that People believe that it's really quick. So let's say you're not going for your insurer because insurers tend to advocate towards paying because it's cheaper. Let's say you're not going for your insurer though and you're going to have to pay the ransom yourself. Paying isn't straightforward and it's not very quick and easy to do at a company level. Setting up crypto wallets at company level is not a two second job at all. That takes time. So if you haven't prepared that, you're going to be on the back foot. The second side of this that I see a lot is this very mistaken belief that the cryptocurrency landscape operates in the same way that the fiat landscape does, in that we have banks who can track payments and block accounts, and we can reclaim money, and there's this whole network. It's obviously not like that. It's been specifically designed to be decentralized, and as such, there is no person to stop these transactions. So quick show of hands, how many people know about how we clean, we know, they, <laughs> they clean money through the cryptocurrency blockchain? Quite a few. Pretty good. So for those of you who don't know, it's very, very complicated and very unlikely that you'll ever be able to trace the transaction nor actually recover any money. In fact, the cases where even law enforcement have done that have been really, really limited um, and not as impressive as they've put forward, to be honest. Uh, one of one such case was the Dark Side Colonial Pipeline case, where I think they recovered 20% of the ransom paid or something like that, um, which isn't, it isn't great. Um, so on the cryptocurrency sort of blockchain world, there's two ways that they can have privacy. You can have it natively or you can have it as app-based. So um, things like Monero, which is a privacy coin, have privacy built in natively, whereas Bitcoin, it's app-based. So it works a bit differently. And we used to see ransoms almost always be demanded in Bitcoin. Then Darkside went for Colonial Pipeline, which was a bit of a mistake from a strategic perspective. 
the FBI got involved. There was a lot of noise. Some of the ransom was discovered and reclaimed. Um, and there was a big shift that happened after that case. And then attackers started saying, we'll give you this big discount if you pay in Monero or you pay in a privacy coin because you can't trace the privacy coin. In fact, not only can you not trace a privacy coin, they set up stealth addresses so you don't even know who the people are that are transacting. So it's not even like the Bitcoin blockchain where you can see wallets. It is literally complete. I mean, it's a work of art, to be perfectly honest. doesn't help us at all, but it is a work of art. So they tend to try and use Monero. But even if they don't and they use Bitcoin, it's really, really difficult to trace the Bitcoin payments because they'll use techniques such as coin join, um, chain hopping, which is jumping between different blockchains, um, and then mixing services as well, where they'll mix Bitcoin with lots of other sources of Bitcoin and pay it out in random denominations, repeat the process over and over and over. And without those mixing services giving you any logs, which obviously they don't keep, um, you have no idea. You have absolutely no idea where the money's going. Um, and so that's the biggest problem with ransomware, but it also means you are not going to be able to get this money back. So if your C-suite think this is an option, it's not. You pay it, it's gone, that's the end of it. On to the next quote. Our evil again. Um, this was actually said in communications to JBS, which was a company that they attacked a couple of years ago. And they had this really long drawn out communication that has actually been published, if you want to go read it, um, where they are talking about how they're in business, not war. They're, they're your business. But think of us more like your business partners, <laughs> they would say. Um, and it was sort of um, someone joked online that it was sort of a, an unexpected encryption event <laughs> to use business lingo as opposed to a ransomware attack. Um, but yeah, they're, a, they're an interesting group. They've put out a recent video, actually. I don't know if you've seen it. It's not well made. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. The next one is, everything is burning, but it won't take long to recover. Just chill. This is my personal bugbear, I suppose, of all of the misconceptions that C-suites have. And actually, a lot of this comes down to us and our mistakes, I think, as a community. And one of the things we have to be really careful of is that when we give, I'm going to use the term gold team, basically just depicting that C-suite team that's making strategic decisions in an incident. When we give our gold team information about our options, for example, containment, um, we need to communicate to them what exactly we mean. What actually is this red button that we're saying exists that we can push? And I had this recently with a client where the CISO said, well, actually, we can disconnect the entire organization from the internet. And the CEO was like, and then what happens? And they said, well, then the attacks contained. And he said, okay, do that. No consequences discussed. No, well, this is what will happen and everything. So, you know, I was saying, we were saying over lunch um, with, with Holly and um, she's had a similar experience where they're sort of like, okay, yeah, that's fine. And I said, you know, okay, so how are you going to contact these people and your incident response plan? Oh, that's on the G drive. Okay. Can we access the G drive? Then the CEO is like, yeah, 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 we can. Yeah, it's on the, yeah, we'll just pull it off the G. I'm like, mm. <laughs> you just press the red button though. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've lost all of that. And the problem I'm trying to convey here is that we need to be very proactive and careful when we discuss these options with these C-suite people because they don't understand it. They don't understand the consequences of it. They're panicked. They know their neck's on the line in this incident and that the CEO may be rolled out in front of the media and it's all a disaster for them. So we have to be really careful when we give them options that they can use to make sure they understand what happens if we do that. Because nothing that we do is without consequence. So if you pull the organization from the internet, what does that mean? What does that mean for your, for getting everything back online? What does that mean in terms of time? Um, and to say, I've seen a lot of panic containment, as I would call it, um, is a bit of an understatement. So what does it mean to do those things? And what are the actual options that you've got? Because they don't tend to truly understand what that means. 
And I don't think they truly understand what taking something offline means in terms of recovery either. It's not a magical red button that you press and everything's back. You've probably also had this when you speak to the C-suite and you say, this is what this is what's happened. And they say, well, we've got backups. We'll just restore from backup. And you're like, okay, yeah, we can we can do that. But the length of time that this is going to take isn't isn't short. And if you ask them how long they think, in fact, you should do this, go and ask them how long they think it would take to restore everything from backup. And I guarantee you they will put the number in minutes or hours. So unless you've got an amazing capability, which maybe you have, in which case can I know about it, um, they are basing their decisions off of something that's not even real. All their decision making is based off the fact that there's this button, they press it and everything's back online. Then your decision making is completely flawed. It's in our interest to do as agreed. We've helped hundreds of companies. Yeah. Um, it's quite funny, actually, when you read, I recommend you do read if it's published. Um, the US um, Congress have actually published lots of these communications with big companies that have had ransomware attacks. It's very interesting to read them. Um, they are incredibly friendly and helpful. It's unbelievable the customer service you get. I mean, I've been to Marks and Spencers and you do not get that level of service. I can tell you that for a start. Um, they're really, really helpful, really friendly. Um, and yeah, they'll give you, they'll give you plenty of time. I mean, often they'll, uh, you pay a deposit, they'll extend the deadline. It's not a problem. We're all in business. <laughs> okay. So how do we avoid some of these traps? So the first thing, um, plans and playbooks. These are really, really important. However, they are important, but I've never seen them work completely as they're written down. So there needs to be a level of flexibility in them to allow for different decision making. But have a comms playbook. Talk to your comms team and make sure they understand what a cyber incident looks like and how you need to escalate the comms over time. So something like a ransomware incident, you know how that's likely going to play out in your organization. You can talk to the comms team and you can build some comms templates that mean that you're good to go. Having plans and playbooks that are for your sort of silver and bronze teams, so your tactical and operational teams, invaluable. But have them for the gold team as well. And make sure they're written in such a way that the gold team actually understand what that means and what that is. because they don't get it. Then you run exercises to make sure you test them. Are there holes in those things? Um, so if you haven't run exercises, do like one for your gold team, one for your silver, one for your bronze, and then build up to a point where you run an organizational wide one. And you try and see how those teams interact because they won't <laughs> interact very well. I can assure you the first time you do that, you will be horrified. <laughs> um, but it's a really good exercise to do. Um, and I think... One thing that's really key to impart is we don't want to be making up as we go along, as it's happening. We won't be in a good state of mind to do that. We will be panicked. We will be working ridiculous hours. We'll be tired. We are not in a receptive state to do that. So a bit like the, the capita thing, it went from IT outage to, okay, it's a small attack to, okay, it's a large attack, but no data was stolen. Then it was, okay, some data was stolen. Then it was, okay, all the data was in an unsecured S3 bucket. <laughs> and it escalated to this absolutely ridiculous level. Um, and you don't want to be doing that. You want to have a plan and actually stick to that plan. The final point is redundancy, dependency, and the intolerable harm threshold. And these three concepts are really, really key to getting a really good incident response plan and capability up and running within your organization. So regarding redundancy... I'm a climber, so I have to get in a climbing reference because otherwise I've failed as a human being in the climbing community's eyes. Um, but as a climber, when you're climbing up a rock face or a mountain and you stop and you're going to belay your partner up, you need to make an anchor. You need to secure yourself to that rock. And you do so not by putting one wire into the rock, because if that fails, that's it. I die. Holly dies. <laughs> That's the bad bit. That's the bad bit. That's when it goes bad. Um, you don't really want two because potentially two things could fail. You have three and they're all completely in different bits of rock. So if one failed, there'd be two backing up. Completely independent, 
not at all reliant on the others, and hopefully I won't kill Holly. This is the same thing in your organization. Do you have truly redundant processes that are operating completely independently? This includes communications channels. Have signal groups set up for these teams so that if everything was to go down, there would be a way of communicating out of band. A lot of, com- a lot of companies don't do that. Dependency. You know, thinking about, like I said, if the G drive goes down, what does that mean? What processes and systems are dependent upon that? And how do we make sure that they can stay up and running? And the final one, which is the intolerable harm threshold, is actually a financial services concept that was really pushed hard by the FCA a couple of years ago. Um, and it's a bit like the maximum tolerable downtime thing, but it's a bit different in the sense that what they look at in this situation is the amount of harm that can result from something being down. So if you look at your important business services and you think, how long could that honestly be down for before we reached a point that actually it almost wouldn't be worth recovering? We've reached a point of harm that just can't be recovered from at that point. It's a really important exercise and something that I think you'll be surprised at if you haven't done it, looking at how long things can be down for before you couldn't do anything about it. In investment banking, for example, that's usually a couple hours max before you're in big, big trouble if you haven't got key platforms up. For manufacturing, that could be a lot longer. If you've ordered in the right materials, you could potentially have months before you reach that threshold. But understanding where each of those things sit for your important business services means if you get hit, you really understand how long you've got to get a solution up and running or a workaround up and running. So it's really important. So I'm going to leave you with this quote, which came from the Conti Leaks. This was from one of their recruiters, Salmon, talking to a new hire who was called Core. <laughs> the weekends are the weekends. No one cancels vacations and sick days. Unlike at Red Goat Cyber, where we do do that. All of those things. Um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, come see me afterwards. I also have military grade unhackable goat stickers. So if you want that, come see me.